the driving of computers into nearly everything, and the transition of information to digital. And it means that information, which previously would have been other, other things, physical objects, et cetera, is now riding on those rails. And the point is that whether it's 5G telecom networks or you know the sixth generation telecom networks, which are currently being designed, we're wiring our entire world for potentially like totalitarianism. Howdy, everyone, and welcome back to Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma. I'm the president of American Moment, and I'm joined by Nick Solheim, the COO of American Moment. And once again, we have a fantastic episode for you guys, as we always do. We're at hundreds or hundred of great episodes for you guys. Uh, We're grateful, as always, that you guys continue to listen. You know, there's this funny phenomenon where after guests come on the show, kind of sort of as a favor, they'll come back to me a week and a half, two weeks later, and they'll say, hey, uh, some really interesting people reached out to me after the episode. Uh, You guys have some reach, huh? And I'm like, that's right. Um, so thank you as always for listening. Uh, this week we have a fantastic episode uh, with a friend and one of the most brilliant people that we have on the right of center. That's Josh Steinman. But before I get to that, uh, be sure to go to AmericanMoment.org. There you can find everything that we have cooking as an organization. You can find the backlog of this podcast. You can find the application for Foundations of American Statecraft, Conflict, Foreign Policy, and Diplomacy. This is the credentialing program for mid-level foreign policy staff in Washington, D.C. that we're in the process process of spinning up, you can find any other events, or programs, and news clippings of all of the people who are very interested in what we have to do. Uh, there's a lot of content on there. Be sure to check it out. But this week, we had Josh Steinman, who is a former military officer turned entrepreneur. From 2017 to 2021, he served at the, at the White House on the National Security Council staff as Deputy Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Cyber. In that role, he coordinated all cyber, telecommunications, cryptocurrency, and supply chain policy for the United States government. He is now co-founder of Galvanic, a industrial control systems cybersecurity company. You can find him at Joshua Steinman on Twitter, and he blogs at steinman.substack.com. Josh is one of the rare value add Twitter follows because you will learn things about the world, about national security, about China, about supply chains and about tech that you don't learn elsewhere. So I highly do recommend it. What did you make of the episode we just taped, Nick? It was fascinating. Um, We talked a lot about, um, you know, how our, uh, you know, defense industry uh, invents, creates these weapons, how they get manufactured, um, you know, preparing for for war. Uh, the threat of China, they're eating our lunch, um, many people are saying. Yeah, it was a very, very fantastic uh, episode. I learned a lot. And I second the the thing about uh, threads on on Twitter. It's He's basically one of the only guys that actually adds value to my Twitter feed. So we'll go now to Joshua Steinman. Josh, thank you for coming on the podcast. It's Rob, great to be here. We always like to hear about how our guests got where they are. You're one of the rare people who has gone from politics to the private sector, and it doesn't seem like grift. So I want to hear that story. <laughs> I want to hear the long version of it. Tell us where you came from and what you're doing. Yeah, I grew up in Michigan. I went to college in Chicago. When I was in high school, I had spent a summer actually here in Washington, D.C. at Georgetown University and had to do a writing assignment for the program and ended up doing a very extensive research paper on Osama bin Laden. And this was three months before 9-11. So spent a month, two months, just researching and and writing about Al-Qaeda and US foreign policy. So 9-11 happened and immediately I knew it was a Al-Qaeda attack. They had been, well, for various reasons, we could go into that if you want, but, uh, Got to college the next fall and just started diving in really deep into history of Islamic radicalism, Imperial, Britain, uh, CT methodologies, just a whole bunch of stuff. Eventually got myself pulled into some interesting corners in the Navy. 
out of college and yeah, had, had a, had a blast in the, in the, in the Navy, did two tours in Iraq in nine, 10 and 11 and 12 realized it really wasn't for me, uh, had had a great time up until that point and started thinking about getting out. And so looked at grad school, decided I was going to do that at night, was doing grad school at night as I was thinking about getting out, started a small side hustle business on the side, funded it through Kickstarter, got my sort of entrepreneurial juices flowing. Was this the socks? This is the socks. Yeah. <laughs> so I was doing really the socks. Nice socks. Yeah, yeah, I was doing the socks. After I got back from my second deployment to Iraq, I was still on active duty. I was working at a, you know, uh, you know, redacted location here in Washington, D.C. And on my lunch breaks, I would go out, get my phone. You got to like lock up your phone, go outside, walk around in the parking lot and like call wool suppliers like in uniform in the D.C. heat in the summer. Uh, cut my teeth, just figured, figured out some business basics and then also got pulled into working for the chief of naval operations at this time on a task force that was looking at asymmetric opportunities for the U.S. Navy, both offensive and defensive. In that capacity, I wrote a- What's an asymmetric opportunity? A balloon. <laughs> so cheap, but effective. Yeah, I mean, you could you could talk about costs in, in multiple different ways. So I, I won't say specifically what we did or did not work on, uh, but you could say things like balloons are asymmetric opportunities. You could say unmanned is an asymmetric opportunity. One great example uh, is around unmanned platforms that are surface platforms. And so the U.S. military is very bought in on manned platforms. Those can be Humvees or tanks or ships or airplanes. And back in 2013, 2014, 2015, and the chief of naval operations referred to us as his personal heretics because <laughs> we would go around and talk to other senior military officers or pentagon bureaucrats or whomever and then we'd also interface with the private sector and we would say things that they really just didn't want to hear like you know tell fighter pilots that maybe there would be air-to-air -air combat platforms that wouldn't have humans in them if you just do the math like the platforms that we have have stresses that far exceed the capability of a human pilot, meaning like the plane can the plane can take X number of G-forces. And the reason why it doesn't is because you have a human in there. Yeah, that would, it would kill Meat the sack. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so we would point these things out. We would ask questions. And then we ran experiments. We would go out into the private sector, buy COTS equipment or come up with novel concepts and then demonstrate them and then bring them back to Navy leadership so I was running one such experiment with a technology company and we were trying to more tightly integrate the data that we collect with who it's being serviced to. And so you can imagine that like a Navy ship collects all this information and what actually ends up happening is you have like sensor platforms on a ship and those sensor platforms then translate that data to a computer screen for a human. And that human then has to like read and interpret that data accurately. And then what does that human do? That human then turns around and speaks, you know, uses, you know, auditory signal to communicate to another human that then has to make a decision. Then that human makes a decision. And what do they do? They issue auditory commands back to another human who then puts human input into a machine that then tells another machine what to do. And so we were looking at, I was running a small program to try and figure out if we could tighten those processes up. And in the process of doing that and working with this big Silicon Valley company, I had a bunch of Silicon Valley executives pull me aside and say, hey, we have this problem. We have a bunch of like military people that come out here all the time. And they come and they sit in this conference room right here. They ask us about what we do, we tell them. And then they leave and they're like, this is a waste of our time. And yet it keeps happening. I immediately recognize what was going on, which is in the military, when you take command of a unit, you do a familiarization tour. So imagine that you're the commander of an infantry unit 
but you've just come from the Pentagon or the War College or something like that, and you show up at your at your new unit, and those people inside that unit say, let me take you around to all the other units that we work with, our logistics unit, our health unit, our this unit, our that unit, these sister units that help you do things. And you go and you sit and you take that brief, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, that commander is just sitting there getting talked to like, hey, we're the 303rd logistical studies group, you know, like, uh, this is what we do and this is where we go. And the commander's like, great. Thanks for telling me that. And then they get up and they walk away. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sounds good. Yeah. And so you had these cutting edge units that would go out to Silicon Valley and ta- and what they thought they were doing was like taking the brief. Tell me what you do here at Facebook. Um, <laughs> and what the Facebook people thought, or it wasn't Facebook, but like, for example, if we were talking about Facebook, they were thinking that this was going to be some type of business or partnership or sales opportunity. Total mismatch. Yeah. So these executives pull me aside. Like Be- said, is that because the the units thought that they're partnered already? Like they thought they were already bought in as a stakeholder or kind of at a vague level or? I, I think it was multifaceted. Mm. Probably they were out there because it was novel and exciting. Mm-hmm. Right, Silicon Valley is like cool. Yeah, you get to sit in front of insert X famous tech CEO and you exactly. get to go home to your wife and say, I got to meet X famous tech exactly. CEO. These people are also very senior. Maybe they're thinking about what they're going to do next. I see. Having those types of relationships in their mind is like, well, maybe I'll be able to call this person later. Uh, I saw a lot of that and and that does happen a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, those aren't the people they should hire. They should hire the staffers that are working for those people. But uh, that I think motivates them as well. And then I think also there is this aspect of there was a yearning and they there remains a yearning of people understanding that there are new and novel ways to do things and hoping that some sort of inspiration will strike. Mm-hmm. So I, I wrote this paper for the Joint Chiefs, for the Chief of Naval Operations, who then took it to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. For folks that don't understand what I just said, because you know the military is just a bunch of nested acronyms. Military services, the you know, Army, Navy, Air Force, the Marine Corps, part of the Navy, uh, Space Force, part of the Air Force, Coast Guard. These are military services, each of which has like a senior officer. So in the Navy, that's the Chief of Naval Operations, uh, Chief of Staff of the Army. Etc. They all have a name, but it's a four-star general who serves on a committee called the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and those people are advisors to the president. Now, the services themselves do something called man, train, and equip, which is they recruit people, they buy things, and they train them how to use those things. But then they ship them out to operational units, then go work for combatant commanders, NORTHCOM, SOUTHCOM, PACOM, TRANSCOM, SOCOM, et cetera. And so when military things happen, it's not the Joint Chiefs that are ordering it, it's the combatant commanders that are in charge. But the Joint Chiefs sit as the sort of senior group of military officers deciding these big strategic questions for the Department of Defense uh, that are, um, that are, you know, sit over in the Pentagon. Anyway, so the chief of naval operations wrote this paper for him and I was like, hey, there's a huge disconnect between the Department of Defense and Silicon Valley. And that disconnect is increasing. What year was this? 2014, okay. end of 2014, middle end of 2014. Okay. Yeah. And then I was advocating for it in 15 and I got out in early 15. So yeah, I was 14. And I was like, look, this divide is increasing. We ought to be engaging with these folks, huge opportunities here. And I had, in my military time, done some work out of an embassy, done some work out of uh, our embassy in Baghdad. And embassies are interesting places. So you go to an embassy and you get to interact with the host government, but you also serve as that interactive portal for the rest of the United States government to interact with that host government. So people come through the embassy and you're almost like a tour guide when you're working, when you're a senior official at an embassy. 
So I wrote this paper saying, hey, we need to create an embassy in Silicon Valley or an embassy style function because everyone wants to come out and take the meetings at, you know, fancy company X. Really like 5% of those people do need to go sit with those folks. But actually, we can find the people inside that company that they should really be talking to to be mission effective. And instead, if they want to come out and like breathe in the air of Silicon Valley and like go to a coffee shop in Palo Alto, meet some startup founders, like you can handle that within the embassy. You can brief them in the embassy. You can take them around. But what it won't do is burn those relationships that should be getting built in Silicon Valley. And the interesting thing is Silicon Valley was born out of the defense industrial base. Of course. And so this is sort of a proposal to return to that type of a relationship that is much more, you know, uh, cohabitative, I guess you could say. Um, I wouldn't want to say collaborative because it's not exactly that. But can you talk more about that? Like yeah. how Silicon Valley, I know we're kind of aware of it, but I don't think we get a lot of very tech inclined listeners. So explaining yeah. why, how the, how Silicon Valley was born out of that. Yeah, so it had to do with uh, Second World War and defense production around weapons systems, research, a lot of stuff that was happening at Stanford. Uh, and then, yeah, early compute, nuclear program, uh, et cetera, like go down any number of those rabbit holes. But essentially, there were there were a bunch of locations where a bunch of cutting edge research was happening and then execution. And so... Silicon Valley was one of them. And there's a great history uh, written by Steve Blank, which maybe we could put in the show notes, mm -hmm. that talks about the history of the Department of Defense and Silicon Valley, and a bunch of other essays as well. But essentially in the 50s and the 60s, yeah, there was huge interconnections there. Again, the semiconductor industry itself, which was as a, as a, you know, their primary customer was the defense industrial base. And it was only in the 70s and the 80s that those things started to diverge, at least from my understanding. And so I write this paper I'm like, hey, we need to create a embassy style function in Silicon Valley. And I briefed it to CNO. I briefed it to the staff, um, the personal staff of the director of the National Security Agency and a, a bunch of other senior officers and civilians in the Pentagon. Wasn't sure where it was going to go. I had already, it's called dropping papers. I'd already dropped my papers to resign from active duty. And yeah, the last week, my last week on active duty, I got a phone call. I was out processing from the Navy and they were like, hey, SECDEF actually decided to go forward with this program. It turns out that there had been another, there had been a civilian uh, political appointee in the Pentagon that had also been advocating for the same thing. And basically the two initiatives kind of came together and he made it happen. So I got off active duty, went out to Palo Alto, was working at a startup after a startup that I'd founded, just totally burned. <laughs> um, thankfully it was quick uh, and became a reservist in the Navy and helped stand up what's now known as the Defense Innovation Unit. And so entrepreneur stuff, I get out, I'm working in Palo Alto. And then, you know, you sort of moonlight when you're a reservist. So helping to stand up the Defense Innovation Unit. And then an old an old boss of mine called me up one day. The president had just, sorry, uh, Donald Trump had just announced that he was going to run for president. And after like a few weeks of just watching I came to the conclusion that he was going to win the primary. And this was very early. I want to say it was like 15. I, I, I can pull the date. And the same sort of mentality that I'd used to try and build this small demonstration project in the Navy had been what had animated me to support, uh, you know, then candidate, uh, now President Trump. And that had been that he moved fast. And I don't think people understand how important that is in so many aspects of competition. And we could call that politics, you can call that war. But I'd once had an opportunity to speak with a senior staffer at a presidential campaign that had failed. And I won't say more than that. And I'd asked them how quickly they were able to come up with 
public material. You know, I, I wouldn't even want to say anything more because it would sort of divulge. Like, how quickly do you come up with responses when things happen? And their answer was, oh, you know, we were pretty fast, usually about, you know, 12 to 24 hours. And I just saw President Trump tweeting things. <laughs> and I was like, that is uh, multiple orders of magnitude faster. Yeah. And like that just, it wins. It wins competitions. Um, so yeah, I had this old boss call me up, ask me to come help out after. So um, we talked when the pres when Trump announced and I was like, hey, yeah, I think this thing's going to go. Let me know if I can help. And then once the president won, uh, he called me up and was like, hey, come help me out on the transition team. That's how I got myself to the White House. That's fascinating. Were you day one? Yeah. What was that first job and how did you navigate through the Byzantine and treacherous bureaucracy that was required for good people to get in on day one? So I'd been asked, so the old boss was Mike Flynn. So I'd worked for Mike when we were in the military. Mm. Obviously he was much more senior to me. Mm -hmm. And so he had asked me to come just sort through uh, the, the binders full of both men and women. <laughs> <laughs> Hundreds of people wanted to join the National Security Council, which is they an always office. always do. <laughs> office of the White the House. The worst people want to join the National Security Council very often. Many good people. <laughs> Let me tell you, many good people. Yeah, um, Kloster, when he came on the show once, said, you know, the, the the people to watch out for are the ones who, when they come in for an interview, it's like, so where do you want to work in the admin? And they're like, oh, I don't know, a national security role or international finance. It's like, oh, I see. <laughs> you yeah. want to take fancy trips around the world or get a payout on Wall Street afterwards. Yeah. That's nice. Go away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it it was very interesting to see so hundreds of people, every everyone is sending their resumes to powerful, influential people to send to the transition team. So my job was one of the most unglamorous jobs in the world, which is like I sat for the entire transition and just read resumes and sorted them into three piles. You know, do not talk to, must talk to, and then a little pile in the middle, which is like, if we don't, you know, if we don't find anyone, you can go through these, mm -hmm. through the must talk to thousands of resumes. There were only two of us doing this. And then every night I would, not every night, but you know, every few nights I'd sit down with, uh, again, soon to be national security advisor, Mike Flynn and KT McFarland. And we would just go over and say, hey, talk to these people. I'll set up the interviews or the other person was setting up the interviews. And yeah, then at the end, there was some question about the cyber and technology office on the NSC. And I was working at a venture back startup at the time. I thought it was going to do quite well. And I thought I was going back. And Mike asked me to stay to take that job. And so I, and this was like maybe 10 days before the admin, I didn't expect that I was going to, you know, I wasn't there to get a job. I was there to just help him out because he'd, you know, been very good to me when I was in the military. And so, yeah, I thought about it and then took the job. And 10 days later at 9 a.m. on the day of President Trump's inauguration, they put a bunch of us into a van and they drove us to the White House. So Obama is still president. They parked us in the Situation Room. They gave us all these like transition binders. That's what it's called. It's like, Welcome to the National Security Council. Like these are all the things you need to be worried about in your, <laughs> in your portfolio. Yeah. Here's all the stuff you didn't see on the news. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, you know, Russia cyber, China cyber, this, that, whatever it is. Yeah. Huge briefing papers. Yeah. So they sat and it were just 10, might have even been less, might have been like eight of us. I do have a photo somewhere. And we were just sitting there waiting for the president to get inaugurated like watching it on the screen in like the situ you know, situation room that you like see on TV, kind of surreal. And so everything went out, off without a hitch. And was, it, was there any, were the Obama appointees that you guys were getting briefed by poker faced as he was getting inaugurated? So it, they weren't really there. What, I, what day of the week was it? Was it like a weekend? It's always a Tuesday, Is it a right? Tuesday? I think so. I don't remember. No, yeah. I don't think it was. That's election day. You're yeah, election day is a Tuesday. Yeah. yeah. No, because what happened was that the first day was actually the 23rd. So maybe it was like a Friday or something. Mm -hmm. 
there really wasn't anyone there. He wants to know if there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> That's what he's asking about. Yeah. I mean, the photo, the photo record <laughs> clearly illustrates that there yeah, was yeah. plenty of gnashing of teeth. <laughs> um, but yeah, I know. I just remember it was empty. Yeah. Yeah. What were some of the challenges that you experienced right away? Those first, like, you know, hundred days. Yeah. On the job. Everyone wants to be your friend. Hmm. <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah. And they want to come in and tell you why the things that were being done previously ought to continue. Yeah. And so. Please, bro, please. Yeah. <laughs> it was more. When you're talking, yeah. is, is that career bureaucrats yeah. you're talking about in that case? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But then also remember that the career bureaucrats still break about 95-5, maybe 90-10, did not vote for the president. Mm -hmm. uh, those things that they were asking to continue, those policies, were not really reflective of his priorities. And then at the same time, you know, people start writing articles and there's really nothing about me in public except for the sock stuff. And so, you know, everyone's sort of putting out into the ether that, you know, there's some chump in this job because um, there was all sorts of very well credentialed people that should have gotten that of job course, and they did not of course of yeah. course you know never mind pesky things like who they supported or what policies they want to yeah. see you know brought into reality and so nothing about the nothing about my um, military work nothing about the defense innovation stuff none of that stuff was public or you know even really now is very public and so I think a lot of people thought that they could come in, and this happens often with inexperienced political appointees, and they sort of put their arm around your shoulder and they say, you know, we're going to be best friends. And many people will latch onto that because it's sort of like a lifeline. And so I had to very carefully navigate those types of waters for most of my time, actually, um, because it can be very sensitive. Was being part of the military formerly helpful in recognizing certain patterns of how people behave um because i can imagine it, can, it goes a couple ways for for guys that come in as political appointees it could you know they, they could be wise to the act or they could fall into old habits of being part of that bureaucracy and yeah. sublimate themselves like we have the same problem with veterans who become members of congress it's like Speaker of the House, that's the general. And it's like, no, he's not. Hey, yeah. can, don't, don't do that. You can yeah. topple him if you want to, <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. Um, so what, what was what was the military experience helpful? Um, I had a very unique military experience, and my very unique military experience was helpful. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that if I'd had the normal military experience that that would have been as helpful, but I can speak to my own my own experience, which was operating in you know uncertain environments and having to you know, deal with people of questionable motivation and understand what was driving them and try and shape those environments to the benefit of, you know, the American people, which is what I was doing when I was in the military. And so certainly my background was quite useful. And again, because it was obscure to most people, everyone, no one knew what I had done. They, they thought, you know, I'd just been in the Navy. Maybe they thought I'd been on a ship or something like that. And, and that played to my advantage as well, because I don't think they understood that I knew more than I let on. Fascinating. What was the dynamic um, in the National Security Council vis-a-vis -vis the Pentagon um, and the State Department? Um, was it an adversarial one? Um, what was the information flow like? I mean, the, these dynamics are different in each presidential administration. What was it like in that first year under President Trump? Yeah. In most administrations, they're quite adversarial, and the Trump administration was an apex example of that. You know, one of Jim Mattis's first acts was to try and bring Michelle Flournoy on as his deputy, and she would have been either the national security advisor or the secretary of defense for had Hillary won a, a notional President Clinton. And Mattis quite famously brought all of his political appointees together very early and said that he was going to run a nonpartisan Department of Defense 
which seems like something that, you know, as an American citizen, like, of course, we should have a nonpartisan um, Department of Defense. But if you actually unpack that intellectually, you know, elections are partisan activities. Yeah. And what he was saying was he was going to have a non-political Department of Defense. And the thing is that that is not actually what civilian control of the military means. Yeah. It's <laughs> like, oh, so that means that this Department of Defense would have been run the same way if we had President Clinton or President Trump. Hmm. <laughs> that doesn't seem like yeah. democracy to me. Yeah. But, let yeah. alone the fact that every time they've talked about things being bipartisan for the last 30 years, we've like, on foreign policy, we've all gotten screwed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and and what it was essentially saying was Mattis telling the career bureaucrats that he would not be advocating for the policies of the of his boss, the president of the United States and the commander in chief of the armed forces. And so it was challenging from the beginning. And I think look you don't have to trust, you know, don't, don't trust my words about it. Like they have all talked. I read it in the news. They, you can read it in the news. You can read it in their books. Yeah. They brag about it. Yeah. They're like, basically, you know, we, we took the constitutional obligation to have a commander in chief and we decided to, to give it a single finger. Yeah. Can, can you talk a little bit about, uh, there's an interesting dynamic, uh, at least I've, I've heard because so many of those NSC positions are not required to be Senate confirmed. And so, um, none of them. Yeah, and, and right. And so yeah. it's it's in some way um, the biggest opportunity for a president to immediately put in his people vis-a-vis um, yeah. -vis something like DOD or State Department where it's like, oh, you know, you have to have all the pretty credentials and stuff. Um, any dissident minded president that wants to go against the entrenched bureaucracy at the Pentagon and DOD or the Department of State, would you uh, what would your advice to them be specifically on on the composition of NSC? I have advice. I'm going to withhold a fair, <laughs> a fair amount of it um, because shock and awe is a real thing. Uh, I think the National Security Council offers a great opportunity for any president to, as you said, immediately start affecting policy. I think there's a there's a requirement that you also put in competent staff maybe below the Senate confirmed level at the departments and agencies in order to be able to reach out and affect the changes or alterations that that president wishes to achieve in the short term. Obviously, then having political appointees at the assistant under deputy and secretary level is critical. But yeah, the National Security Council is a play. And again, it's a White House office. People don't understand this. NSC staffers are White House staffers, and none of them are no White House staffer is Senate confirmed. Well, there are some weird exception. Let's say OMB director, et cetera. But like by and large, <coughs> White House staffers are not politically or they're not Senate confirmed. And so, yeah, you can bring in sort of outlier folks. You know, I never should have. I never should have had that job. You know, it wasn't on anyone's list. Uh, and several other people were able to hyper creative people were able to take positions and very quickly demonstrate their competence in in those types of spaces so there's a lot of stuff that could be said about what you do there what i will point out is that the nsc staff which has fluctuated between i think at the lowest it was like 14 or 15 i want to say under like president kennedy something like that and the obama team crested it at like 430 people Jeez. and the thing is due to some various legal structural things, the actual budget is very small. And so depending on how you cut it, and again, there's a whole bunch of details here that are not worth going into at this format, you can really only hire somewhere between 15 and 30 people. And so then the question is, where do you get the rest of them from? If you are going to have an NSC staff that is of the 100 plus order magnitude and you must recruit them from the departments and agencies and so most nsc staffers are actually career civil servants detailed to NSC. correct now there are some ways that you can play with that again not worth not worth going into here 
But it means that in many cases, agencies will try and get their people on to NSE staff as a way to advocate for their interests. And so it's a very interesting place because you can sort of see as those people who are paid by their home agencies and working at the White House are and, and nominally working for the president. And in, and in many cases, you know, they're they're interested to serve the president, but they they do have these interesting relationships because they're going back. They'll go back to those agencies at the end. So it's a very delicate balance that you have to uh, you have to have. Yeah. What about your portfolio specifically running the the cyber side of things? What was the what was your headspace in that first year of the administration in terms of what the acute challenges that the United States needed to address were? And I guess paint a picture of that mm -hmm. geopolitical moment. Um, people always love to refer back to 2016. Uh, that was seven years ago. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a while ago. And so yeah. sometimes it's important to recalibrate um, to where we were at that point in time. Mm hmm. So I ended up owning cyber, telecom, supply chain, and cryptocurrency policy. Good thing those didn't get more important. Good thing those <laughs> didn't get more important. That's right. I had what you All the call, stuff the boomers don't know anything about? Give it to Josh. <laughs> that was literally, I kid you not, that was literally it. Yeah. Um, yeah, like... Yes. The shape rotator portfolio. It was literally it was the shape rotator portfolio. Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, it was interesting, and yeah, in many cases it was just like some strange technology thing. They're just like give it to Steinman, and so look, I had guilty knowledge from my military time, which was still fresh, and so I knew a bunch of the challenges that we had in that portfolio, especially with regards to the national security aspects. And there are some aspects of that portfolio that are not explicitly national security, like telecom policy, which just sits at the National Security Council because the NSC acts as a coordinating, excuse me, a coordinating body. And so telecom itself, which the vast majority of is civilian, uh, you still coordinate it out of the National Security Council. Mm -hmm. And so for the for the pure national security stuff with regards to cyber and some of those other things i knew a lot from my military time and i knew where a lot of bodies were buried mm -hmm. and so we got we got right to work i brought in uh someone that i trusted very much who was still in the military detailed him over to the national security council and yeah we we got after it I think the biggest challenges during that time actually persist today. And you can articulate those quite cleanly by saying, we're taking computers and we're putting them into everything. And internet of things. It, it's beyond it's beyond that. It's like how many computers exist in this room yeah. right now? And by computers, I mean uh, any any number of any number of things like these microphones could be considered you know, as printed circuit boards in here. Yeah, right. It's very different yeah. than this light bulb ago. probably is because I was really looking at it because it has uh, for safety regulations. You know, in terms of auto switches and stuff um, to do with fire hazards, it probably has to have just very small little PCB in there yeah. that 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 modulates that. Yeah. I mean, this is also a magnetic thing, so it definitely does. But yeah. point being, yeah, and so. There are these huge implications, and I think that if you look at that trend of digitization, the national security impacts are downstream of that. Mm -hmm. And then on the more theoretical and abstract level, we're living in a time where information is transitioning from something that is analog to something that is digital. And that may sound like a dumb thing to say, not as in like, I'm a stupid person, but as in like, it's like too simple. But if you if you actually think through what that implies, the second and third order impacts are existential to society. Complete that sentence, like what, what exactly? Think about this. 
2,000 years ago, wealth was land. It was like non-movable. You know, you owned a farm. Maybe you had cattle or something like that and you could sell the cattle. Um, but, you know, around the 15th, 16th centuries, European governments began to actually create currency, like physical tokens that could represent value as an idea and be transported. And this allowed, this is what we would call a soft technology. A soft technology meaning it enables uh, uh, movement of energy across vast distances. The energy that you're moving with tokenized specie with money is value. So I can do a bunch of work over here and I can transform that into a physical thing that I take over here and I can go do work with it over here. I can pay someone to do something. I can buy something, et cetera. Yeah. So that's like one information transition, uh, information transition movement, 15th, 16th centuries. What's happening now and, and has been happening is that instead of turning things into physical tokens, dollars, again, this is, we'll talk about money, but you can talk about other things as well. Um, we've gone from physical tokens to electrons and money is just one soft technology. You can talk about speech, right? As along the same lines, 2000 years ago, if I wanted to communicate something like the story about, about how a bunch of, you know, young, uh, military aged males decided to sail across the ocean and wage war against the city that had stolen the daughter of one of our princes. <laughs> I had to memorize it and I had to walk around ancient Greece and orally relay that story to you. Mm -hmm. Then you had writing tokenization that allowed us to record that information. And then I didn't need to walk around and recite it orally, but I could hand those things out. Maybe I had to hand write it. And you have the printing press that further transitions that information. And, and again, now we have this digital moment where things are, that information layer is becoming even, even more frictionless. So whether it's money going from land to, and you know, whatever livestock to species, to like physical tokens and, and dollars to some example, or to some extent to digital objects, to speech, et cetera, et cetera. Um, weapons are undergoing the same, the exact same transition. And so if you think about those two things, you have the, driving of digital objects into physical objects as like the biggest priority in my mind. And that is part of this larger trend of information transformation. And again, it's not some consultant term. It is like these soft technologies are, are permeating that almost everything that we did is downstream from that. Uh, that's probably like pretty high level. Yeah, no, it, it yeah. makes a ton of sense, though. Um, so in the midst of that transformation, there are concrete implications for the way that the United States defends itself. Um, and DOD and the way that it procures the technology and in many cases incentivizes the creation of the technology that changes the country um, is at the leading edge of that. Talk me through broadly what were the reforms that you guys tried to pursue in the Trump administration on how the Department of Defense goes about procuring the technology um, that defends the country and and uh, and generating it um, and what still needs to happen? So one of the uh, first of all, just to be very clear, there's an entire defense shop at the National Security Council, and, and those folks were leading some of that charge. Then there's also a Pentagon office that um rights policy around procurement of weapon systems and things like that also responsible the stuff that we worked on cyber telecom supply chain cryptocurrency was about how we operate in the digital domain and i don't i almost exclusively don't mean 
any of the like IO stuff, if only because I think it's a sideshow. But like, how do we operate in the cyber domain as a government? That can be intelligence or military or civil, you know, like State Department. Uh, and how do we protect the country against those two transitional things that I was talking about? Like the driving of, of computers into everything and the digitization of everything. And so as we made policy, it was a reflection of our concern about protecting the country against those trends. And then also our desire to take advantage of them and make sure that we were able to maximally put them to work for the American people. So I would say our biggest priority had to do with people. We like to say in cyber, people are the capability. And so whether that's advocating for better STEM education or programs for the Department of Defense to recruit and train people who are highly specialized. And then internal training programs as well, both for the US government and for civilians. So it's rarely talked about, but one of the things that we actually did was put together a competition to find out who the best teacher of like computer science and cyber stuff is in the country. And we did that through the National Security Council to like create competitions <clears throat> to, um, you know, promote kids learning about these topics. Yeah. At the same time, who did like, it end up being? I think it was some woman from like Alaska the first year. It was That's awesome. it was very interesting. <laughs> um, Are we talking like K twelve level or college yeah, level or all? Actually, yeah. so we had like a bunch of we have a bunch of different levels. The award's still getting being given out. Now it's probably given to like climate people. Well, we were very specific. <laughs> cyber, yeah. cyber only. Um, but all of that feeds an apparatus that allows us to go out and hold our adversaries at risk in cyberspace and then defend our own critical infrastructure. And so, you know, we're not out here giving prizes to teachers because, you know, we like them. Mm. We're out here because it is a critical national security issue. And this problem is only going to compound over the coming years and decades. Yeah. One of the parts of, um, in general, the heterodox perspectives on a variety of issues that that are emergent on the right these days that I like to keep coming back to is um, that there's no silo between these policy areas. Um, the immigration side of this is one that makes you want to rip my hair out because mm -hmm. traditionally out of Silicon Valley, the answer to, well, we don't have many technically competent people or we don't have the, the best talent is more immigration, more immigration, more immigration. Can't really do that for your national security side of the ledger mm -hmm. because like first generation immigrants are usually kind of risky assets in that space. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about how that has compounded the problem in a way that may not even be visible from the private sector? Yeah, it's very interesting to watch how academia has evolved over time. And you have these very strange incentives, essentially to not bring in Americans to grad schools. It's yeah. like really strange. And so I think there's a huge opportunity for some educational reform that promotes, again, K through 12 STEM education, and then also reform of the graduate schools. Because if you go to these places, it's like, what are they selecting for? It's like, well, who can pay the full fare, right? Um, and, uh, and you know, looking the other way when it's very clear that people maybe aren't writing their own essays or they're coming from countries that don't wish us well. <laughs> um, and uh, it, it is quite frustrating. I think that there's a huge opportunity there uh, to, you know, start working on behalf of the country. <laughs> yeah. Talk to me about the, um, capital incentives, uh, in this space on the private sector side. Um, for the past 20 to 30 years, the marginal dollar being invested from wall street has gone to chase either like quant style micro trading or monetizing the attention of your seven year old on social media. Um, and there has been consequently a deprioritization of hard tech and some of these harder problems. Um, 
are those uh, incentives, those pressures, something that is on the mind of policymakers uh, in this field? And, and is there anything that can be done to rectify it? Yeah. So I ended up taking over this policy area at the White House. We called it supply chain. And yeah, I think this is a huge national security concern. It still is. Frankly, the Biden team could be doing much worse. Yeah. In what they're like, I'm, I'm Catherine Ty is fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, the concern for me is essentially we have, as you've framed it, which is that with that information transition that has been happening for 40 years, uh, there was a lot of money to be made in financialization of vast swaths of our economy. And when you abstract away the factory and you just say, I don't need to fa the factory, I'm looking at a balance sheet, I'm looking at forward cost projections, I'm looking at this, I'm looking at that. And then you say, okay, um, let's just find the most cost competitive place to build X, Y, or Z. All of a sudden, the fact that you have a factory in Gary, Indiana, or where I'm from, Detroit, Michigan, becomes not as material to the balance sheet of that corporation. And so I, I think what happened is that especially the Chinese Communist Party has taken advantage of this and they understand that th this is a very long game that needs to be played. And frankly, they did a very good job of extracting a lot of the industrial processes and functions of our industrial economy into theirs. And so we did a great deal of work in trying to think through and then execute how we would re-incentivize. A lot of that was President Trump's tariffs, but then a lot of it was other policies that we started to put in place. How do we re-incentivize the return of that industrial infrastructure to the United States? And what is uh, innovation you know, in the defense tech space in particular look like being that you can't do that? You know, that you yeah. can't outsource it. Yeah. There's a lot that can be done just with that information transition transition trend that I identified. And it's interesting because it goes to this question of speed. I don't want to talk my book here, but there is a company that I've invested in. And I, I won't even talk about what the company specifically does, but I'll just use it as a general example they make critical parts of things that are used in a wide range of technologies. I'm mm -hmm. not even talking about the company's name or what industry it operates in. So at the abstract level, big company has to buy a critical part and they say, uh, let's go make this part and order it. And then it'll get manufactured and shipped and installed. The make this part and order it is traditionally, was traditionally done nearly by hand. Like I'm gonna draft up drawings for the item that we need to make. Maybe now it's done on a computer. I'm gonna like, you know, make what are called CAD, CAD drawings on a computer. What next? I'm gonna email them to someone. That person's then gonna have to translate those drawings into some type of telemetry that then gets translated to a machine that then gets you know, starts milling a piece or, you know, it doesn't have to be a 3D or it doesn't have to be a, a CNC machine, but it could be any aspect of the manufacturing process. And if you actually pick apart each one of those phases of a contract, what you'll actually see is that, sure, the manufacturing of something takes a long time, but up front, the design, negotiation, all these other things take just as much time. And so there are plenty of companies out here that are essentially following this format that I'm articulating to you. And actually, there's two in very different areas that in, that I've invested in uh, that I'm talking about here. But so if you admit that you can't actually change the way in which you manufacture these things, what you realize is what you can do is you can radically shorten the design and con contractual negotiation time time scales. And you can do that using internet-based technologies like uh, Figma, if you've used yeah, this, yeah. right? So think like Figma 
for making X. If you do that, you can cut these timelines from months to weeks. And, you know, any astute financial engineer will tell you that velocity of money is really important. So if you shorten your buying cycle from like a year to like four months from like I've ordered it to it's delivered, mm -hmm. like you can actually see some pretty interesting financial returns. Yeah. So this the profit cycle compounds. Um, it lets you do more, more with more. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So how do you like extrapolate this to the rest of the economy, like outside of, you know, our defense base? Oh, I think it absolutely will be. So, I mean, I invested in another company that's doing this in the, in the food sector where they're doing the exact same thing. They're decreasing cycle times and it, changes the unit economics again I, I don't i don't want to talk my book so i won't talk specifically where it's in but like so i've invested in two companies that are doing this in the defense space and i've invested in one company that's doing it in the food and beverage space and again at the very abstract level you could obviously there's a bunch of opportunities here mm -hmm. are you worried about um grift like uh, one of your friends, Jay Malik, tweeted a couple months ago, and it's, it's stuck with me ever since. You know, the kind of person he takes least seriously in the world is someone who, like, a year and a half ago uh, was Web3 investor and today is a defense industrial base investor. And, you know, day after today, he's probably an AI investor. And, yeah. you know, so is, is there like a funny money chasing the trends, um, mimetic quality to, to some of the renewed attention that's coming to this issue that, that, on first blush, I'm really excited about, but on second blush, I'm like, mm, I don't know if it's you guys that should be doing this. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because it's been, you know, I've been doing this stuff now for 10 years and you remember I, getting laughed out of rooms when people, I, when you said this, was I remember important. getting laughed out of rooms yeah. and not only that, but I remember meeting some of these folks they don't remember meeting me. <laughs> um, and so, it, yeah, it's very interesting. It, not only that, but it's like there are maybe a handful of people that I know that have been doing this as long as me in this generation. There are other generations, previous generations that have also done very similar mm -hmm. things. Uh, there's a great book uh, that Mark Andreessen has recommended at least once on a podcast that I heard him on. Elting Morrison, the book's called Men, Machine, and Modern Times. And it is an amazing set of vignettes about defense innovation at the, uh, at the midpoint in the century and maybe before. Great book. And it's funny because I uh, listened to Andreessen give an interview where he recommends this book. I went out and read it and it was like, I've been in this room <laughs> getting yelled at by like the the chief gunner in the navy about the way in which we you know do naval gunnery um and so i you know th very little of what me and my friends had been doing you know before it was cool um surprised me when i read about these previous eras and look, that's a sign of the some amount of success, right? right? Like the Defense Innovation Unit, there are plenty of people that claim that they helped create it. Um, I obviously wasn't the sole <laughs> person that did it, but like good on them. I'm glad yeah. that there's 20 people out there saying that they did it. Um, I'm glad that, you know, people sort of come around. I'm glad that, you know, even people like Elizabeth Warren are talking about this stuff on the Hill. It's a sign of success. Yeah. Uh, I think that, my biggest concern, and I had this at every phase, when we had this 10-person task of heretics working for the senior officer in the Navy, the chief of naval operations, everyone wanted to come work for us. Like all the other active duty, you know, um, Navy officers and enlisted wanted to come join this little task force. And the thing that we always tried to select against was actually empathy because there are plenty of people out there that want to come and join up with the new hot thing. And they're like, yeah, AI is the thing. Like, this is the thing, et cetera, defense tech, A and D, whatever you want to call it. But very few people are willing, and it takes a while 
right? To deeply understand the problems, to understand who faces them, and then try and go out and solve them. And when we were working on this task force, I would sit people down and I would say something very offensive to most modern ears, which is, how are you going to help me kill the enemy faster? And people would be like, well, no, no, I wanted to join the innovation council. <laughs> and be like, no, no, our job is to literally go out and murder the enemy. Yeah. And like, you're going to help me do it better if you, if you get across this line. So like, what's your plan? Yeah. Because the whole point is like, you know, and I'd been to some extent, one of these people like out there and like, I didn't want fancier toys because I like toys. Mm -hmm. I wanted fancier toys because they would have helped us go find people better. Like out manhunting against, you know, uh, foreign commandos or whatever as we were doing. And it's like, I wanted data science to find these people. And instead I had groups of people, you know, crunching numbers for hours a day. And it was like a, a waste, of, not a, it wasn't a waste of time because we succeeded, but it was like, you want someone that has empathy for the customer. Startup people are very good about this. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the reasons why I love reading people like, Paul Graham, who's the founder of Y Combinator, he he has this seminal essay called Do Things That Don't Scale. And it talks about essentially having empathy for your customer. You must go out and understand. So with all of this fancy stuff and everyone's like, yeah, national security technology and this and that and whatever. And it comes down to, you know, and, and I certainly stand in judgment of nearly everyone that I meet. So, you know, but I hope people judge themselves as, you know, as much as anyone can judge them. The point is like, you have to judge whether or not you're having empathy for the people that you will eventually s support, right? So all these folks, why some of it rings hollow is like, I'm not sure they understand the challenges that they're trying to overcome. I hope they do, genuinely, I hope they do. But it's like, until you've been to these factories or used the equipment or done this or done that or talked with, you could just go down this list. It's like, I'm just not sure that they're here to actually do the thing that like desperately needs to be done. Desperately needs to be done. And so then the question is, if they don't have that empathy, which you can only build through some measure of experience, it doesn't have to be military, it doesn't even have to be civilian. Like there are plenty of folks out there that just dig into some of these problems and like, wow, this is super f***ed up. Like it takes this, you know, like like Palmer Lucky, like the kid did like the, the headset thing or whatever, but he's a product guy and he understands like, wow, it's kind of screwed up that like it takes seven years to take someone's idea and then get it into the hands of soldiers. Like what if we brought the SaaS model, software as a service model to the military and charge them for sort of like outcomes like, and then just built cool stuff in order to achieve those outcomes. Like that is empathy right there. Mm -hmm. And there's tons of other empathy with like other companies as mm -hmm. well. Um, but the point is, yeah, that's my, that's my sort of skepticism as I meet all these, all of my new friends. <laughs> I love them all. Um, but like, that's my judgment, which is that like, do I think this person actually has empathy for the customer and, um, that you know that's that's the thing that i think needs to happen because otherwise they'll just move on right. right if they don't have empathy if they don't care is this a problem yeah. that drives them in the morning or is it generically chasing trends that drives them in the morning that's yeah the being in the cool hot thing yeah you know what's the thing that you're paying attention to right now that no one else is that you're blue in the face about mm. yeah telecom infrastructure was big it was it was big in the white house I owned the the telecom problem, the 5G problem, et cetera. And why that's blue in the face is because going back to that trend that we were talking about, the driving of computers into nearly everything and the transition of information to digital. And it means that information, which previously would have been other, other things, physical objects, et cetera, is now riding on those rails. And the point is that whether it's 5G telecom networks or you know the sixth generation telecom networks, which are currently being designed, we're wiring our entire world for 
potentially like totalitarianism, right? So if you look at what the Chinese Communist Party has done inside China, is trying to deploy and their client, you know, cities, potentially states in Africa, Southeast Asia, et cetera. You know, it used to be a perfect example, New York City subway token, right? Like everybody, not everybody, some people may know what that is. It was like a, a little disc of whatever metal it was, maybe copper and steel with like some type of a designed hole punched in the center, maybe a square or a star or something like that. Okay, so it used to be that like I could have 10 of them on me and I could give you guys three and be like, hey, let's meet downtown tomorrow. Wouldn't matter who you are, what you do. You walk up to the turnstile, you put that token in, and that is the information that tells the system to process you through it, right? Well, as you move to a phone, now I know that like, maybe I don't want Sarab getting on the subway. Maybe I don't like you. Maybe you like tweeted the wrong thing. Maybe you like did an interview with the heretic who made a <laughs> comment about Elizabeth Warren. And you know what? That's not very nice. You're not allowed to ride the subway anymore. You're not allowed to drink that hot coffee from that internet connected mug that you bought anymore. You're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to drive your car, right? You're not allowed to drive your car more than 50 miles because some like strange looking 14 year old girl says that like everything's going to end in 2023 mm -hmm. the autism brigade yeah yeah exactly yeah, yeah peter calls the autism brigade yeah <laughs> autistic exactly. child cabal <laughs> yeah and so as we as we drive digital into everything as we as we informationalize the world it creates you know two poles that we could aim at obviously you've got and who knows if we'll ever get to one or the other but you have the totalitarian pole that we can go towards. A guy named John Robb, who's a really good former former special operations pilot turned entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Now he just writes on the internet. Good guy. Um, calls it the long night. Um, and then, you know, on the left, a sort of free world. And so that's that's probably my deepest concern is that as everything becomes an, a node in an interconnected web of devices, that essentially we have this ability, society has this ability to do terrible things to people, literally at the touch of a button. Josh, where can people keep up with you and everything you're doing? The internet. <laughs> I'm on Twitter, it's Joshua Steinman, just at Joshua Steinman. And then Occasionally, I do write on a Substack blog. That's just my last name, steinman.substack.com, I think. Well, thank you for coming on the show and uh, highly recommend people follow you on Twitter. It's one of the few accounts out there actually putting new information into the, the mix as opposed to just regurgitating old takes. So thank thanks, you. Rob. Great to be here. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed that. We certainly enjoyed taping it. I had to do a little private event with Josh afterwards um, with some executives and senior Hill staff and such. And he's really just such a, a wealth of wisdom. Really encourage you guys continue to follow him and follow all of the guests that we have on this show. Uh, be sure to check out the backlog of this podcast at AmericanMoment.org. Apply for any new programs we have and be sure to rate and review the podcast five stars. It really does help us in the ratings. If you write a nice review, we'll tweet about it. We'll talk about it on the show. Uh, five stars only, please. Uh, on Apple, Spotify, subscribe on YouTube. Uh, we put in a lot of effort to make this a video and audio production and you can see uh, my beautiful beautiful face and nick's face um be sure to tune in my next Taliban week beard. <laughs> <laughs> that's right nick has decided as all gingers inadvertently do uh to grow a giant beard even though it is as kids say scaring the hose so uh be sure to check that out you call on... my wife a hoe no i'm saying colloquially <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> um it is quite quite terrifying so uh thank you guys as always for listening and we will see you guys next week Moment of Truth is an American Moment Studios production filmed at the Conservative Partnership Center. Our podcast is produced and edited by Jake Mercier and Jared Cummings. Our intro music is A Minor Struggle by Ryan Serenich. Don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms, and you can go to AmericanMoment.org to learn more. Thank you.